Hogan, you got behind us. I know you got us. <laughs> Our scripture reading for today, it comes from the letter to the Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Listen now to the word of the Lord. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling in which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us came to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every ligament when it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, it is good to be with you this morning. But I have a confession to make. I am Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> Feels good to get that off my chest. But I tell you that in order to tell you this. In Lutheran circles, we spend a lot of time talking about calling or vocation. Lutherans love to talk about what it means to live out their calling or how they are pursuing their vocation. My wife and I went to a small Lutheran college called Valparaiso University. If you've heard of it, it's because you like college basketball and you've heard of a guy named Bryce Drew. Every freshman takes a humanities class where you are introduced to a diverse reading list that covers the stages of life. Under the work section, we spend most of our time being introduced to this notion of vocation, and we read a short piece by Frederick Beekman. Beekner writes, Your vocation in life is where your greatest joy meets the world's deepest need. This single sentence becomes everyone's favorite quote, and for the next four years, <laughs> many students spend their time trying to figure out what exactly is their greatest joy and how it intersects with the great need in the world. Or worse, they are convinced by the institution that the very thing they are studying is or will become their greatest joy, and they will use it to solve a great need. Such a perspective is optimistic at best and harmful at worst. Say someone studied nursing, and for four years she was convinced that being a nurse would bring her great joy. And it obviously meets a great need in the world. Yet upon becoming a nurse, she finds no joy. In fact, the position plagues her with anxiety and stress, not only at work, but at home. And as
has for the satisfaction of meeting a great need, helping people who are sick or in need, that satisfaction quickly fizzles out. I thought this was my calling, she cries. That's what I was told. Questions of what she is supposed to be doing in life affects her, but she feels like she must continue with nursing because, after all, she was convinced that that was her calling, and therefore she must do this job and do it to the best of her ability because that's how a Christian lives out their calling. The quote from Buechner and many explanations of calling often invite a person to see a single job or an occupation as their calling. But surely God calls us to more than a single job or occupation, or to more than just work. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. But what could that calling be? If I'm not called to a job where my vocation is not an occupation, what then is my calling? Brothers and sisters, the calling to which you have been called is Christ Jesus. I know, I know, that may sound like a seminarian's Sunday school answer, and I see some of you seminarians shaking your heads, but hear me out. It is in the waters of our one baptism that we are joined to the death and resurrection of Jesus, marked as a child of God, and made a member of the body of Christ. And because Christ is the head of that body, it is by him and him alone that we are called. Moreover, in our scripture reading today, we are told that we must grow up into him who is the head, into Christ. Brothers and sisters, that is our calling. To manifest Christ in every way. What exactly does that mean? Well, that's a good question. It means, according to our scripture, that we lead a life with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And we do this in all our walks of life, as a parent, as a child, as a spouse, a co-worker, a friend, and a neighbor. But if we live this way, if we continue to grow up into Christ, what comes of it? What is the hope? The one hope of your calling, of our calling, according to our scripture reading, is the building up of the body of Christ. And so all of creation comes to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God. But no pressure. <laughs> it is a lofty hope, to be sure, Especially when we consider that this hope is fulfilled only when the body works properly, only when we speak truth in love. In our culture and current political tension, we are reluctant to claim truth. We are more critical and doubtful of the information we hear or are told. But church, we have certain certainty we have a certainty in the truth of one Lord, one Spirit, one God and parent of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And it is our calling to speak that truth and to speak it with love. This imperative sounds so easy, yet it is likely we tend to do one or the other. Some may tend to speak truth, finding it important to tell others why they are wrong or misguided by staunchly expressing their unyielding opinions and tightly held beliefs. Truth may have been spoken, but with no love. Others may bend toward a love that manifests itself in niceties, kind regards, smiles, hugs, and handshakes. But that love cannot fathom the thought of discomfort or rejection at claiming truth. Love may have been enacted, but with no truth. Our author tells us that the two must be inextricably linked, and that the body, this church, 
cannot build itself up if we are missing one or the other. And friends, that's only one instruction that our text gives us. There are potentially at least nine more commands that Paul gives us to live out our calling. But the truth of the matter is that we all struggle to do so. In fact, we struggle probably just to live out one of these instructions. I know I struggle to manifest Christ in my roles as a son, as a brother, as a friend, and most certainly as a husband. The very person I have been joined together to as one, I often treat with harshness instead of gentleness. I act with pride instead of humility. My patience quickly becomes thin, and all of this leaves me bearing no one in love but myself. The hardest part about understanding our call is knowing that we cannot fully satisfy it. We cannot, in all our walks of life, at all times, manifest Christ. Martin Luther helps explain this paradox. He writes, quote, This life, therefore, is not godliness, but the process of becoming godly. Not health, but getting well. Not being, but coming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not now what we shall be, but we are on the way. The process is not yet finished, but it is actively going on. This is not the goal, but it is the right road. At present, everything does not gleam and sparkle, but everything is being cleansed." End quote. Brothers and sisters, recognize that our calling is not to be fully grown, but to continue growing up. Not to be built, but to continue building up. Resting assured that Christ will bring all things to completion. You are called. You are called to so much more than a job or an occupation. Your calling is not to work alone. Rather, your calling is in Christ Jesus alone. To grow up in every way into Him. Your calling is to bear with one another in love and make every effort to maintain peace and unity. The beauty of this vocation is that we can strive to do so in all our walks of life, in our jobs, our relationships, and in all our responsibilities. But know that we do not carry this calling alone. Each of us are called by Christ, uniting all of us together in one body. We are the church. A community of the called, working together in order to grow this body. But this body does not always work properly, as this morning might have indicated at times. <laughs> we can become like children, gullible and naive to the lies and deceitfulness of this world, causing us to try and rip apart the ligaments that have joined us together. Yet as a called people, through the death and resurrection of Christ, we are given grace. So when we get tired from bearing with one another in love, when we fail to lead our life with all humility, and gentleness, and patience, when we no longer speak the truth in love, we come to this one table. We come to Christ's table, and it is here we experience that grace. It is here at this table we are reunited. It is here at this table we are strengthened time and time again by this bread of life and this cup of salvation, so that by grace alone we may lead a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. Amen. Amen.